Alan Iverson is a six-foot score-first guard from Hampton, Virginia, who starred at Georgetown University for two seasons under John Thompson and then played 14 seasons in the NBA for a variety of teams. He's predominantly associated with the Philadelphia 76ers, the team that drafted him first overall in the 1996 NBA draft. He was an evasive, creative scorer with an overwhelmingly explosive first step and a fiery on-court demeanor. A controversial character with a broad, unmistakable impact on basketball at large, Allen Iverson is undoubtedly one of the most unique and befuddling talents ever to lace him up. Today we're going to talk about the first seven years of Allen's career, from his freshman year at Georgetown all the way until his crowning professional season of basketball with the Sixers in 2001. After a very publicized incident at a bowling alley, Iverson found himself in jail and eventually a reform school. Iverson's trial was pretty brilliantly documented in the ESPN 30 for 30 film No Crossover. If you haven't seen it, I highly recommend that you do. From a PR perspective, Iverson to Georgetown was a good opportunity for everyone. Allen got to attempt to repair the public's perception of him under a legendary coach, John Thompson, at a legendary program, Georgetown. And John Thompson got to swoop in during an unusual situation and snag one of the truly transcendent basketball talents of our time. For a school that traditionally featured big men, a ball-dominant scoring guard like Iverson was a new thing. His scoring and off-the-chart speed in the open court were must-see TV. He racked up accolades in a short time, earning first-team All-America in his sophomore year and twice earning Big East Defensive Player of the Year, and eventually establishing the record for career scoring average at 22.9 points per game. You took the good with the bad with Iverson. He was prone to driving without a plan, taking long, tough shots shots early in the shot clock and losing sight of his surroundings once he penetrated. Iverson's talent was wild, oftentimes raw and bleeding beyond the margins of structured offense or defense. His talent created highlights and havoc, some of which would have burned Twitter to the ground had it existed. He's remembered now as a scrappy, resourceful scorer for his size, but it's easy to forget that Iverson was also a phenomenal athlete. At his size, only a truly exceptional athlete could do the things that he was doing. And there's a good argument to be made that with the ball in his hands, Iverson was one of the fastest players in the history of hoops. He was also a top recruit in both basketball and football, something that's only happened a few times. His leaping often gets forgotten though. A two-footed leaper, Iverson did things at Georgetown that were shocking for a six-foot guard. His athleticism and explosiveness would often just erupt in situations where you didn't even remotely see it coming. No one could stay in front of him, and in the open court, you were likely fouling him if he got in open space with the ball. As a Hoya, Iverson averaged nearly nine free throw attempts per game. Allen would go on to get drafted number one by the Sixers, an organization that, sad to say, hadn't seen some good basketball in quite some time. Early on, it became glaringly obvious that no one in the NBA could stay in front of Iverson. Iverson was a prototypical bucket getter. He had the mentality of a scoring wing in the body of a point guard, a Bengal tiger born in the body of a lynx. His wide array of floaters, bending, dipping layups, and surprisingly physical runs at the rim were infuriating for opposing defenses. Allen was likely unleashed by the openness of the NBA game, which at the time prohibited zone defense. One-on-one, -on -one, there was just not a soul on earth that could stay in front of him, and if he could see a double team coming, he could split defenders easily because of that build. Reaching against Iverson in open space was a death sentence. Had Iverson been 6'3 or 6'4, it's amazing to imagine what he might have been like. Extremely high usage, hard to play with, takes more shots than Kevin Hart at the Super Bowl. If only there were a comparison in today's game. Stylistically, the combination of Iverson's quickness and skill made him especially hard to deal with off the dribble. Here he gives MJ a half taste of the move to test if he'll nibble the bait. Watch the second time that he goes back to his left hand. It's not just a lateral movement to the other hand. He absorbs the momentum of the ball and brings it as far to that side of his body as he can. And it's that slight forward motion that's the most devastating. Both the ball and the left foot advance forward enough to force the defender to commit. What's amazing is that Jordan actually does a pretty great job Job recovering from the first move, opening his stance back up to attempt to swipe at the ball, but he's in full loss prevention mode as he turns his body to the right to contest what looks like a left
left side drive. And just like that, Iverson crosses right back over to his right hand, creating enough space to shoot while going to his right. Now Jordan is fully behind and forced to attempt to contest. Not quick enough. Bottoms! This was the nightmare of guarding Allen Iverson. While AI wasn't the most efficient scorer throughout his career, which is putting it mildly, he basically never quit coming at you. Possibly the most uncontainable scoring ball handler the game's ever seen, Iverson's offensive approach was like electricity finding the ground. He would find a path, and he would find it quickly. During that season, Iverson broke the rookie record for consecutive games of 40 points or more. He did it five times in a row. And on the fifth time, he scored 50 on the Cavs. Poor Cavs. The Sixers lost every single one of those games, but hey, it was a good time. In an absolutely loaded draft class that included the likes of Ray Allen, Kobe Bryant, Steve Nash, and Antoine Walker, Iverson won Rookie of the Year in convincing fashion. Let me ask you this, how many things are cooler than AI wearing that Georgetown uniform and rocking the most iconic basketball shoe of all time? Survey says zero. Sonic Boom! Iverson's rookie shoe was his most memorable. They were also super comfortable to hoop in. I had a pair. One of the best debut shoes of all time, in my opinion. And I was just catching up to the crossover. So how do you do this new move? This commercial kills me because Reebok really banked on this Spencer guy who I remember at the time thinking, why is the dad from Camp Nowhere in this commercial? And then for him to open up with, and I was just catching up with the crossover. My God, no, you were not. Reebok always seemed overly giddy to be associated with Iverson. Maybe be a bit less available, guys. Also, if you did this move anywhere near organized basketball, you were getting ripped. Although I do admit doing this one in my driveway a whole lot. These were slick, simple, decent. These are my least favorite of the group by far. These will always be associated with stepping over Ty Lu. Also, dude didn't even have him laced up when he stepped over Ty Lu. He made an all-time play and he didn't even have his shoes tied. That might sum up Allen Iverson as well as anything. Iverson and Jerry Stackhouse were two of the more exciting college players of their time, but they didn't really work together in reality. Both guys thrived on taking a high volume of shots and dominating the ball. They'd rank one and two in usage, shot attempts, missed shots, and a bunch of bad stats just a few years later. So their ability to coexist was shown to be busted pretty quickly. Stackhouse was traded in the offseason for pieces that would later prove to be important, and the Sixers got the opportunity they needed to land a wing that wouldn't clash with AI or need the ball as often. This this looks like a job for Jimmy Jackson. That's like saying, I'm tired of this douchey music. Put on some Florida Georgia line. Jackson was traded mid-season. 1998 also marked the entrance of Larry Brown, a super popular figure among players. He tried to get me out of the league. Year one saw Philly go 31 and 51, improving their rating on the defensive side of the ball and slowing their pace a bit to embrace a new style of basketball. They still missed the playoffs, but it'd be the last time until 2004. As potent as Iverson was off the dribble, he was becoming more and more of a problem as a shooter too. Iverson had always been a capable and marginal shooter, though he was notoriously streaky. His mechanics were quick but imperfect, and he was a threat to get his shot going in just about every direction. Shooting off the dribble would go on to become just as lethal a weapon for him as his drives. He also got great elevation on his jumper with a reasonably high release point, which was a necessity for a guy his size. For all his talents, Iverson was always the type of guy that struggled to blend in schematically. This continued throughout his career, gradually becoming more and more of a threat to his longevity. He had a stubborn offensive approach and presented some tricky defensive deficiencies as trade-offs, limited switchability, and inability to keep stronger defenders out of the lane, and many times full-on disengagement on defense. Too frequently, he surrendered great amounts of space to ball handlers instead of pressuring and denying. His conditioning and weight training really didn't help in this way either. He spent his entire career as one of the smallest, lightest guys in the league, and it's interesting to imagine what he might have done had he taken this part of his career seriously. Any team patient enough to work Allen in off-ball screen action stood a good chance of getting an easy look. His weight caused him to be a liability fighting through those actions. You can see Utah here, an experienced team, picks on him, and challenges his awareness, they get an easy buck. 
For Iverson to be effective in a team defense setting, he had to be surrounded with strong positional defenders that would allow him to do what he did best, create havoc by freelancing in the open floor. High school coaches who watched Iverson play football thought that Allen had the potential to be an NFL-level kick returner or secondary athlete, so it's no surprise that he essentially went his entire hoops career as that type of home run defensive player. He also struggled to continue with over-penetration and involving his teammates. This aspect of Allen's game is intriguing because it makes you wonder how his career would have been different had he been a more balanced playmaker and scorer. Those angles that he so skillfully traversed to create scoring opportunities could have easily been utilized for setting up his teammates, especially when you consider the fact that he possessed those skills. Everybody knew Allen Iverson could pass. Instead, we often got Allen exploring a driving lane to its furthest extent and then making a last resort pass to a nearby teammate who was likely standing still because they were watching Iverson dribble. Iverson also had a particularly bad habit of taking on multiple defenders, and that only gradually improved throughout his career. You could make the argument that Allen's tendency to undervalue his teammates was warranted in some ways, seeing as even his most successful Philly teams were pretty lacking in offensive talent. His offense, though, continued to become one of the more unanswerable quandaries in the league. He was scoring on and off the ball, often from corner double screen action where his twitch quickness made you pick your poison. By 1999, the Sixers were on a good track, finishing 28-22 and 22 during the lockout year and sliding into the playoffs, where they'd eliminate the Magic 3-1 and then get swept by the Pacers. The stage was set for some entertaining years of Sixers basketball, and Brown's philosophy, as much as he and Iverson warred against one another in the media and elsewhere, had begun to bring in the right kind of personnel to make the team competitive. The trend of improvement continued for Iverson and company in 2000 as they leveled up their totals in blocks, rebounds, steals, and assists, and those increases showed up in the win column. They improved to third in the Atlantic, going 49-33 and in a nearly bone-dry Eastern Conference. They'd blitz the Hornets in the first round 3-1 and then fall to the Pacers again, Larry Brown's former team. Allen's production and approach would be the inverse to the makeup of the pieces around him, and that might explain why the setup worked so well. He He'd continue to be the focal point and the driving force for the team as he'd average 28.4 points, 4.7 assists, 2.1 steals, and improve his percentage from 3 to 34%. 2001 was the defining year and the pinnacle of Allen Iverson's career. He'd win his only MVP award, secure first team All NBA, lead the league in scoring, steals, and usage, and log a PER of 24 with a win share of 11.8. They finished 56 and 26, winning their first 10 games and finishing first in the Atlantic. It was a team designed to hide Iverson's weaknesses and set the stage for his strengths. They surrounded him with gritty ensemble guys like Aaron McKee, Eric Snow, Matt Geiger, Theo Ratliff. It was a stronger supporting cast, but Larry Brown still repeatedly said that the team needed Iverson to shoot in the volume that he did. Iverson also shined in one of the more memorable All-Star games of all time, where the East knocked off an insanely stacked West squad. All-Star games aside, the stars were aligning for the Sixers to make their most competent playoff bid in years. In February, Theo Ratliff went down with a wrist injury that would put the pressure on the organization to make a move and seize their window at a title. So they shipped their dominant shot blocker to Atlanta for another one, Dikembe Mutombo. But Tumbo had just enough good basketball left to be a difference maker. People used to think I was a ghost. Uh... Those playoffs gave us some memorable battles between Iverson and prime Vince Carter, Iverson and Ray Allen, Iverson and the legendary Shaq Kobe Lakers at full strength, banged up, undermanned, and ultimately outgunned the Sixers through possibly the only haymaker they had left, and eked out one legendary win against the Lakers on the road in Game 1 of the NBA Finals. It'd be Iverson's only trip to that stage, and it gave us one of the best Game 1s we've ever seen, and one of the more iconic visuals in recent memory. In terms of contributing to winning basketball, it'd be the top of the mountain for Iverson. A defensive-minded team that allowed him to play to his strengths, and an offensively deferential group of players that fed off of Iverson's relentless thirst to score. It came from all angles as he scored 30 or more in 14 of their 22 playoff games. In five of those, he scored 40 and broke 50 on two occasions. It was as close to peak Allen Iverson as we would ever see. You could argue that Allen Iverson's story is in some ways a tragic one. 
It walked a tightrope between the two primary elements of his life, spectacular God-given athletic gifts and an environment that fostered his iron-willed dependence on those gifts. At best, he's a fiery competitor who lived and played with a defiant edge. At worst, he was an unwilling teammate that rarely made his teammates better and discounted huge portions of the game. Still, context matters. It's no secret that a lot of Allen's childhood was troubled and spent wandering the street, lacking real structure or supervision. His father was never around, and his stepfather was ushered off to prison while Allen was still a young kid. In poverty, looking for something that he can count on, his talent would become the most dependable thing in his life for a long time. It rescued him from poverty. And even before the NBA, it funneled him to better living conditions. It likely played a part in him getting second chances with John Thompson in Georgetown. It brought his family out of the projects. It made him special to nearly everyone. Allen likely didn't see it precisely that way. He, rightfully, just thought that he was the best at what he did, and he didn't really have to work at it. It was always just there. It was what he deserved. He'd likely never met anyone that could look him in the eye, no one that could keep him from being himself on the court. But his impact in and beyond basketball was incalculable. His brash persona clashed with teammates, famously ruffled feathers in the media, put him at odds with coaches, and spoke sharply against the idea that anyone could affect how he behaved. He was boldly and unapologetically proud to be a young black man. And that had a huge impact on an entire generation of young black men who wanted to do the same. In the same way that I am the embodiment of a bluegrass cover of a Radiohead song, Allen was the walking, talking, living embodiment of hip hop. And that idea did not go without resistance. The league instituted a dress code just to stifle the fashion movement that he'd stirred. Ball handling was officiated differently. He was a trendsetter. The cornrows, the arm sleeves, the full embrace of tattoos, the headbands. Allen's on-court flair was infectious. For a time, everybody was rocking headbands. Scrawny white kids at the Y would run to their bag and get an arm sleeve. You'd ask them what it was for, but we all knew the answer. It made them feel like Allen Iverson, something most every kid in America and around the basketball world wanted to feel. But that unwillingness to bend would rear its head on the court, too. In his days at Bethel High School, at Georgetown, and in his early days with the Sixers, of course, why bend? Why blend in? Why pass? Why train? Who can do it better than Allen Iverson? That talent will save the day it always has. He never wavered from that. He refused to take a backseat to anyone. But that talent that he relied on would become less reliable. Reliability became delusion. And delusion became toxicity. Iverson's talent burned so brilliantly for so many years, and in that willful, stubborn, relentless, and physically resilient frame of his, it was one of the most remarkable forces in the history of the NBA. Any angle, any shot, any city, any night, Allen Iverson was gonna get his, and with that shameless showmanship that he was so famous for. In that era, in that parentheses of basketball history, you could be certain of that. Let me know if you agree. Hey folks, I appreciate you watching and if you like this video, click the like button and be sure to subscribe. You can also follow me on Twitter at at jkyleman. Say hey!